Um, question time. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, my question is to the Premier. The Premier, why have you indefinitely deferred any jobs target following the COVID-19 crisis? Uh, member for uh, uh, Swan Hills, I didn't realise you were the Premier, but I'll call you to order for the first time, Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, m Mr. Speaker, just prior to uh, answering that question, can I firstly congratulate the member for Dawesville on becoming the opposition leader? Can I congratulate the member for Bass uh, on becoming uh, the deputy leader of the opposition? Can I thank the members uh, for Scarborough? Uh, and the members, uh, member for Nedlands, uh, for their service as both opposition leader and deputy opposition leader. And can I also acknowledge today, and I think we'll do it further later on, the member for Mira Booker, uh, and thank her for her service uh, in the parliament over the course of the last 12 years. Uh, and can I also acknowledge the member for Bateman, uh, who announced his retirement uh, last week, this week. Uh, and uh, I expect both members will be making valedictory st statements later on today. And can also, Mr Speaker, considering uh, this was a bit of an unexpected sitting, uh, thank all those members who are retiring once again. I don't know if anyone's going to put their hands up. And... <laughs> Any others? Maybe half the national. Any others? No? No other takers? This is your last chance if you want to do a valedictory. Uh, and, uh, Mr Speaker, can I also uh, acknowledge you? And uh, I think we did this before, but this is your last uh, day as, uh, as uh, sitting as Speaker uh, of uh, the West Australian Parliament. Uh, Mr Speaker, what happened uh, back in March and April of this year was obviously the world confronted uh, the biggest uh, economic crisis uh, since uh, 1929. Uh, and so uh, the government had to make a range of decisions and a range, very rapid range of changes uh, in order to cope with the situation uh, that we confronted. Uh, and the Cabinet, the Health Minister and myself in particular, uh, had to make a range of decisions very, very quickly. Clearly, we were being advised at a national Cabinet level uh, that the country was potentially facing deaths in the hundreds of thousands of people, uh, and we are also being advised that it would potentially uh, become like a Great Depression. A Great Depression. Uh, so obviously we had to um, deal with uh, and, and basically reflect reality. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, what the, uh, the, some of the policies the government uh, had in place. Uh, the Premier's priorities uh, were aspirations, and I launched them, I think it was last year. They are aspirational targets by 23 24, uh, and uh, the reason we um, moved away from that is because we were facing this extraordinary economic cataclysm uh, as a state. The reality is, uh, since COVID hit, since that earlier part of this year, uh, we've now recovered around 90 around, uh, 8, per cent of the jobs lost. Uh, we have created 63,000 more jobs than existed prior to our arrival in office. We're the only state with an economy that did not go into recession. The other states went into recession. Western Australia did not go into recession. Uh, and if you have a look at all of the figures, retail, land sales, car sales, um, payroll um, returns, um, uh, housing construction um, and, and the like, uh, Western Australia is leading the nation. Our figures are outstanding, considering what is happening around the world. And the reason they're outstanding is we came up with a unique West Australian model. And the unique West Australian model was uh, we kept COVID out with hard borders. We allowed our uh, international economy to continue to flourish, in particular our trading economy didn't shut it down, despite some of the urging of some people around the country. Uh, and uh, then we um, ensured we got back to a state of normalcy as quickly as possible within uh, the hard borders, Mr Speaker. And the results are there for all to see. And, Mr Speaker, um, nationally, our state is doing far better than any other state. And I also add, Mr Speaker, uh, we're the only state that didn't go into deficit. The only state that didn't go into deficit. All the other states in the Commonwealth went into de deficits that are eye-watering, Mr Speaker but not Western Australia, and we managed to launch our $5.5 billion recovery plan in July of this year. Uh, so, Mr Speaker, I think, um, I think Australians, and West Australians in particular, understand the situation confronting us was potentially catac cataclysmic, 
Uh, but the reality is, uh, this state, considering the fact we're now down at, at an unemployment rate of 6.6 per cent, with the highest participation rate in the country, uh, is doing better than anywhere else in the country and potentially better than anywhere else in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Premier. Premier, given that WA, and I quote, has kept COVID out, when will you reinstate a job target and join with the Liberals in ensuring that there is a clear plan for the economy following the COVID-19 crisis? Members, members, Mr Speaker, I just remind the House, the only reason we kept COVID out is the policies that we put in place that you opposed. That you opposed. The Liberal Party, the Liberal Party over the last 10 months has been disgraceful. Members. You've undermined everything we tried to do. The Health Minister and I went through sleepless nights, high stress, extreme circumstances, fighting to keep this state safe and strong, and all the Liberal Party did was undermine and complain the whole way along. And all you did, and all the Liberal Party did, was demand we bring down the hard border at the height of the pandemic. At the height of the pandemic. And then, Mr Speaker, as we know, as we know, the Liberal Party went out there and backed Clive Palmer. You went out there and backed Clive Palmer in his High Court case to bring down the borders, Mr Speaker. So the record is there, and you cannot run away from that record. The Liberal Party's record is there of trying to undermine everything we did, everything we did to keep this state safe and strong, Mr Speaker. But without a shadow cabinet, how do you have a target? Without any policies, how do you have a target? You don't have any policies and you don't have a shadow cabinet, Mr Speaker, and it's only three months to the state election, Mr Speaker. It's only three months to the state election. We don't have a shadow cabinet and we have an opposition who admit they have no policies. So, Mr Speaker, a slogan is not a policy. You need to actually come up with some policies. That's what the opposition needs to do. And you need to, you need to ensure, uh, in fact, I don't think you can uh, because you don't have a shadow cabinet, but you need to actually um, uh, try and give the people of Western Australia a little bit of confidence you know what you're doing. Yeah. The member for Mirabuka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's effort in keeping WA safe and strong, and I ask, can the Premier update the House on how this government's unprecedented $5.5 billion WA recovery plan is supporting more local jobs, more local businesses, and helping to drive more economic activity across the state? Can I uh, thank the member for Mirabuka for the question? And obviously, our approach to dealing with the situation has been very bold, Mr. Speaker. Uh, our approach has been based upon keeping the virus out, and we've now gone eight months without a single community case in Western Australia, unlike every other state in Australia, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we wanted to keep our key industries operating and at a national cabinet level. Uh, I was insistent uh, that our export industries would continue to operate in a COVID safe way. So that's why we got all the uh, FIFO workers from the east to come here, to come here and live, Mr. Speaker. And indeed, major industries are now transferring uh, or transferring their workforces from the east, or just employing locally, Mr. Speaker. An enduring benefit for Western Australia out of what is. Uh, what has taken place. And then within our hard borders, Mr Speaker, we lifted restrictions far more quickly than any other state in Australia. And some other states in Australia are only today talking about going to the two square metre rule. We've been there now, Mr Speaker, for probably six months. Uh, to, probably six months, Mr Speaker. Uh, it's a strategy that has been vindicated by every piece of economic data, Mr Speaker. Uh, we've shown that a strong health res response results in a good uh, economic uh, outcome, Mr Speaker. Yeah. And indeed, we were the first state government to release a recovery plan uh, back in July, Mr Speaker, back in July. So we did the policy work uh, in the midst of a pandemic and released a recovery plan back in mid to late July, Mr Speaker. That's what this government did in the height of a pandemic, Mr Speaker. Only state, Western Australia, only state not to, not to go into recession. West Australian economy is the only state to record growth in annual average terms. Uh, the West Australian economy in the September quarter has grown by 4.9 per cent, and that's underpinned by 11.7 per cent increase in household spending, which is the strongest in Australia, Mr Speaker, and I think the strongest in the history of the state, the uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, and uh, if you go into business. restaurants and cafes, and I must say, people say to me all the time they can't book a restaurant and they can't get somewhere to stay in regional WA, which is testament, which is just, is that a good thing, 
Well, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I mean, I think it's a good thing. I mean, that's an odd... That's, I think that's a very odd interjection, Mr Speaker. I actually think it is a good thing that local small businesses are booming, Mr Speaker. Oh, whatever you say. Never for that. Oh, Just Speaker. don't say anything. Um, Mr Speaker, the building bonus that we put in place, First State in Australia, work with the Commonwealth to put in place the booming building bonus, Mr Speaker. Uh, we now have uh, finance for construction of new homes up 144% on 2019. Uh, and uh, in October, building approvals are up 96 per cent on the same time in 2019, Mr Speaker, the highest growth easily of all the states. In terms of jobs, highest participation rate, uh, second lowest unemployment rate in the country by 0.1 of 1 per cent, uh, and 87 per cent of the jobs lost have been recovered, 63,000 jobs created since we came to office, uh, and huge investment is part of our recovery plan. A whole range of things, TAFE Capital Works, schools uh, and the like, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, all over uh, Western Australia. Uh, and obviously a range of our uh, important projects are coming to fruition at exactly the right time. Uh, Metronet, we're out at uh, Thornley Coven Link today. Uh, nine projects currently under construction. Uh, planning reforms, new approval pathways, less red tape. Uh, our climate policy we launched on Monday, Mr Speaker. Uh, and uh, the LNG Jobs Task Force, the Future Battery Industry Strategy, Hydrogen Strategy, Defence Industry Strategy. Uh, and uh, a range of other uh, important strategies to create jobs uh, across this state. Uh, Mr Speaker, what is clear is this government is keeping our state safe and strong in the midst of a worldwide pandemic that is creating havoc all over the globe. Uh, Western Australia is a beacon uh, of, uh, a, a, of, of people uh, who have done the right thing in difficult circumstances and businesses we have kept open uh, in the midst of difficult circumstances around the country and around the world. Yeah. Yeah. Leader the Opposition. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier. Member for Wanneroo. I'll call you all for the first time. Thank you very much, Speaker. Premier, I re refer to record ambulance ramping in Western Australia for the third month in a row, and I ask, why has this government continued to fail the people of Western Australia by not addressing one of the most fundamental and critically important service delivery, service delivery areas for which your government is responsible? Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, as I said uh, when asked this question uh, before, uh, obviously our hospitals are coping with three things. Uh, firstly, um, there's a backlog of elective surgery because we closed down elective surgery for months on end. And so there's a huge backlog of elective surgery that has our hospitals performing at over 100 per cent when it comes to elective surgery. Uh, and, uh, and, and dealing with that actually fills beds in the hospital that obviously puts stress on the system, if you like, Mr Speaker. Secondly, and inside our emergency departments, uh, there are two streams. There are people who have um, respiratory conditions, Mr Speaker, and non-respiratory -res conditions. That is slowing down the activity uh, within emergency departments, and that is, of course, Mr Speaker, uh, a, uh, another uh, response to COVID. Uh, and we have seen a, a dramatic increase in mental health presentations, Mr Speaker, uh, and that, uh, that has been... Um, I don't know if that has been expected, but I suspect that is also a consequence of what has gone on uh, around the world. Uh, increase in mental health presentations, which is tied down, uh, as you know, our emergency departments. Uh, but, Mr Speaker, we're doing a whole range of initiatives uh, to deal with this. Firstly, uh, we have a huge expansion program on emergency departments around the state. Uh, so Joondalup Hospital, is, which is um, having the most difficulties, uh, has a $256 million uh, upgrade. Uh, that uh, this government is putting in place in conjunction uh, with the Commonwealth, Mr Speaker, uh, which has a major expansion to the ED, Behavioural assess Assessment Unit to deal with uh, drugs and alcohol and the like, Mr Speaker, uh, and a 30-bed acute mental health unit, Mr Speaker. Uh, if you go to the Peel Health Campus, and I was there on Sunday, uh, $10 million improvement to the ED. It's all happening, Mr Speaker, when we were there. Uh, plus, we're also investing another $152 million uh, on a major upgrade to the hospital and ensuring it comes back into yeah. public control, Mr yeah. Speaker. Yeah. Uh, and we're providing the opportunity for a private hospital to be built uh, at that uh, site as well, Mr Speaker, as part of our uh, upgrades. And a range of other hospitals, uh, in particular Sir Giles Gardner, uh, is having $19 million spent uh, on upgrading uh, its ED, Mr Speaker. But it has been a difficult year. Uh, obviously, our hospitals have faced the difficulty as well uh, because of uh, the impacts 
uh, some of them unexpected, uh, of COVID. Uh, and obviously, for a period, they were very quiet. But when they're very quiet, the backlog builds, and dealing with that has been a difficulty our hospitals are coping with. But I'd like to thank and congratulate our health workforce for all of their work during the course of this year. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary, Leader of the Opposition. Premier, can you confirm that the worst ambulance ramping on record is symptomatic of this government's broader failures to have a clear plan for health and hospitals in Western Australia? Oh. Mr Speaker, Premier. the answer is clearly no, but I just explained it to you. I just explained it to the Liberal Party, what has happened. And what we, all we get, and this has been all this year, is undermining and nitpicking about everything we've had to cope with as a state. And, and our hospitals are another example of that, Mr Speaker. You undermine our efforts to try and deal with a very difficult situation that has occurred here. And, Mr Speaker, if you had had your way, if you had had your way, our emergency departments would be overflowing with COVID cases. If you had had your way, we would have had the situation that existed in the eastern states. Members if the on my left had their way, Mr. Speaker. And if you have a look at the emergency departments in Britain or the United States, you will see exactly what would have happened if the Liberal Party had had your way and you brought down the border at the height of a pandemic. Uh, the member for Chandercott. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Transport. Minister, I refer to the McGowan Labor government efforts in keeping the Western Australian economy strong and WA workers safe in their jobs through its significant investment in Metronet. And I ask, can the Minister please update the House on the work underway to deliver the Thornley to Corbin link including the Ranford train station, and how this investment is supporting WA jobs and WA businesses. And can the Minister advise the House if she is aware of anyone who is seeking to undermine this investment in job-creating infrastructure? I the thank Minister the Member for, Transport. for Jandcott for that question and, of course, his commitment together with the member for Southern River and the member for Thornley to the Thornley Coburn link. Of course, we were out there today um, with, the with the Premier and the relevant members looking at a significant milestone of the Thornley Coburn link. The, Co Thornley, Coburn, the Thornley Coburn link currently has over 500 workers on site members and major work started today on the new Ramford Road Bridge. This project, like many projects, is giving Western Australians confidence, is giving Western Australian companies confidence. And today we met Ellie. Ellie was living over east, working on projects over east. She's come back to WA because of Metronet members. She's come back to WA to be with her family and to work on Metronet projects. Starting a Cert II in rail engineering and coming back to WA because we have a pipeline of, of investment. And whatever site you go to, you see Western Australians working and you see those Western Australians that had left coming back to WA because of the infrastructure certainty that we're giving members. A pipeline of work and something that we're very proud of. As I said, today we started piling works at the site. The Premier gave the go-ahead with a 120-tonne piling rig commencing work at the Ramford Road Station site. There will be 156 um, deep holes, 18 metres deep, filled with concrete um, as part of those works. And of course, I love concrete. <laughs> Don't get me started on concrete. The new, eight, the new eight-lane bridge, a new eight-lane Ramford Road bridge, six lanes for um, um, cars, another two lanes for buses. Absolutely incredible. We've also launched the Infrastructure Ready program. The Infrastructure Ready program, which is about getting people who want to change careers or get into our civil construction, give them the opportunity. A massive program. Now, members, while we're getting on with the job, what's the opposition doing, members? They are in, they are in disarray, divided. They are a mess, with no shadow cabinet, no policies and no experience. What do they have? They have a hashtag, a hat and a bus. That is what the opposition is presenting to the public of Western Australia. And if anyone, if anyone saw that media conference yesterday. Now, now, many members would watch Veep, as you know. And what we saw were these two people merge from a freshly painted bus 
to promise everything and say nothing because it was a train wreck of an announcement. We're going to do stuff. Well, what are you going to do? We're going to do stuff. It's going to be better than them. That is the extent of their, of their commitment. On, on, on relevance, the question is on... <laughs> The question is on Metronet. This has nothing to do with Metronet. Not a point of order. In future, just uh, quote the uh, reference number, please, the standing order number. Don't you say relevance, please? Thank you. The question I referred will. to people trying to oppose Metronet. We know the opposition opposes Metronet, don't they? So what have we learnt since the 11 days when the Leader of the Opposition knew he was going to become Opposition Leader? He know, we know he knows a good spray painter. That's about it, members. Because they've got no policies. They go out with a major media conference with no policies apart from we're going to do lots of stuff and it's going to be better than them. You've got to do better, members. You've got to do better. And we're looking forward to every day, every day until that election day, when we can compare the experience of this Premier keeping WA safe and strong to the divided rabble from the other side, whose focus on the first 11 days has been spray painting a bus and embroidering some hats, members. Uh, Member for more. Sorry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question, Mr Speaker, is to the Premier and I ask on behalf of the people of regional Western Australia, will the Premier outline whether he and the Labor Party will fully commit to royalties for regions as it was intended? That is 25% of royalties collected by the state dedicated to a statewide regional development program. Premier. Members. Mr. Speaker, it's interesting because uh, there's only 25% of the National Party members here. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, you know, and, one of, and one of them's a ring in, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, look, Mr. Speaker, as we said, Prior to the last election, we would keep royalties for regions, and that's exactly what we have done. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what we have done. Uh, and you ran a scare campaign uh, prior to the last uh, last election. You're out there uh, saying that uh, we were going to abolish the scheme. It turned out you were wrong. You ran another scare campaign. We were going to abolish the uh, country pension uh, fuel card. Turned out again, you were wrong. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, we kept the scheme. Uh, we're ensuring it's spent wisely. We have pro proper budget processes, processes around it. We don't have the two budget processes that the Liberals and Nationals had last time that drove Colin Barnett nuts. Uh, we have a proper budget process whereby royalties for regions comes in to ERC and measures within it are ticked off and go through the normal cabinet process, Mr Speaker. But if you go all over, all over regional WA, you'll find all sorts of projects, important projects being funded uh, by this government through royalties for regions. And yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I was in Bunbury for the uh, for the uh, for the opening of the Jetty uh, Jetty Road, Mr. Speaker, the wonderful Bunbury waterfront project, Mr. Speaker. I want to congratulate the member for Bunbury. Uh, no, he's he's, uh, he's oh. no doubt there, down there enjoying it, Mr. Not Speaker. There. Uh, not there. He must be up with the nationals. Hey. We have about 85 per cent of our members here. You have, yeah, you know. They all come from Perth. It's pretty easy uh, for them. So, Mr. Speaker, so, Mr. Speaker, I was down there yesterday for that important announcement. Uh, yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I was uh, also in uh, Mandurah, Mr. Speaker, for important upgrades uh, uh, to the uh, to the TAFE College, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and uh, so, our record stands, Mr. Speaker. We are strongly supportive of regional WA. We're keeping an important project program for the people of regional WA. We're keeping the region safe and strong. And if you go out there and you have a look at industries all over the state, the tourism industry, the hospitality industry, mining, agriculture, Mr. Speaker, they're all very, very strong in the midst of a worldwide pandemic, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and that is what this government has ensured will continue to take place. Supplementary member for more. Thank you, Premier. And given your stated support for the program, when may we, we may expect an announcement that the $2.7 billion in cost shifts and underspend in the current state budget will be in fact returned to the Royalties for Regions program? Uh, Mr Premier. Speaker, uh, the Royalties for Regions program is around a billion dollars a year. Uh, and all of that, Mr Speaker, is devoted to regional WA. All devoted to regional WA. All happens, Mr Speaker. But what is very clear is in the lead up to the next state election, there are going to be two sets of commitments by the opposition. Two sets of commitments. And this is a very big issue because 
If the opposition is elected, both of those have to be added together, Mr Speaker. There is no coalition between the Liberals and Nationals. No coalition. Uh, there is two parties form government, and each of their commitments are piled on top of each other. And what we saw last time you came into government is you nearly bankrupted Western Australia. That's right. You could not go to, you could not work together. You had two budget processes. It drove people uh, within the then government, uh, treasurers, uh, and the then premier mad uh, because of the difficulty of trying to govern with that arrangement, Mr Speaker. And I just say to the people of Western Australia, do not risk the Liberals and Nationals. Do not risk it. In the midst of what this country and this world is going through, you cannot risk that. You cannot risk it. You are not ready for government. You are too big a risk to the people of this state. Too big a risk to the people of this state. And that is, there are many reasons why, Mr Speaker, many reasons why, Mr Speaker, the opposition is risky. But one of them is there will be two massive sets of commitments that will need to be added together, Mr Speaker. And clearly, and clearly, we went through that last time you were in office when we weren't in a pandemic, Mr Speaker, where you basically took the state's debt load from around $5 billion to over 40 in the midst of the most, um, the, the, a boom time, Mr Speaker. So clearly, the people of the state cannot risk the Liberals and the Nationals with the way you governed last time being put back into office again at the next election. Yeah. Member for Murray Wellington. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's efforts in keeping West Australia safe and strong, in particular its significant investment in health services across the state. And I ask, can the minister outline to the House how this government's $152 million investment in redeveloping the Peel Health Campus will ensure patients across the Peel and Murray regions are put first? And can the minister advise the House how this government's record compares to the way the Peel Health Campus was treated by the previous Liberal yeah. National yeah. Government? Mr Speaker. Mr. For health. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I was delighted to be with the member for Murray Wellington, the member for Mandurah and the Premier on the weekend to announce the new $152 million upgrade for the Peel, for the Peel Health Campus. Mr Speaker, this is a very proud moment for everyone in the Peel region, because for years they've had to uh, deal with a hospital which was ignored by the other side. Eight and a half years, Mr Mr Speaker, of no expenditure on the redevelopment of that hospital. You have to go back to the Gallup government days, Mr Speaker, to see the, pre the previous uh, in serious investment in this hospital, $3 million under that government, $10 million under the McGowan Labor government, Mr Speaker, to expand the car park and the, um, and the ED at that hospital. None, member for, none, Minister. No dollars at all were spent by the Barnett Liberal government during their eight and a half years in government. And Mr Speaker, in 2019, the Sustainable Health Review identified the Peel area as one of the areas of extreme need and, and, um, and need of significant uh, redevelopment. And Mr Speaker, since that time, the McGowan government has been working hard on putting together this significant development. The Peel region remains one of the fastest growing regions in Western Australia, so this $152 million redevelopment will reinvent the hospital, take it from a health campus to a true regional hospital serving the people of the Peel area. This is a win-win, Mr Speaker, for the Pe for the locals of Dawesville, Murray Wellington, Mandra, for the entire Peel region, because, Mr. Speaker, this, this uh, project delivers on a key election commitment by the McGowan Labor team that we will return into public hands privatised services where it is possible. And I'm very proud to say, Mr. Speaker, that in August 2023, when this contract comes to its end, the uh, public health services at Peel Hospital will be brought back into public hands so that we can have world-class public health services for the people for re of Peel once and for all. But more than that, Mr Speaker, we will continue to see private hospital services provided at that, um, that precinct by creating the opportunity to have a private hospital operating on that campus, similar to the, to the Bunbury Hospital. This is a great outcome for the people of Peel, Mr Speaker. It will involve significantly enhanced emergency care, mental health care, cancer care and palliative care. It has uh, 63 more public beds. 
were taken up to around about 220 beds in all. New mental health facilities, Mr Speaker, a 20, new 20-bed 20 mental health ward as well as a new 10-bed mental health Very observation good. area. Between 15, uh, there will be between 15 and 20 palliative care beds, Member for Murray Wellington, as well as between 8 and 20 chemotherapy chairs. Plus, in, in the future, Mr Speaker, we'll be allowing all those staff who currently work there now to transition across to the public, uh, to the public hospital team with their, with their entitlements intact, Mr Speaker. So, Mr Speaker, this... Well, Member for Murray Wellington, it might surprise you to hear that it was the Member for Dawesville who was the previous oh, member. Oh, and, not a, and not a dollar was spent on this. So the question to the current Member for Dawesville, Mr Speaker, is if we did, were, if we were so unfortunate as to have to endure another Liberal government, would you bring those services back in-house? No, 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 no. So, Mr Speaker, what we have here is this usual equivocation. People, people want to see money. You're not spending a dollar on the emergency department at all. No plan. Thank you, Member. No hey, plan. I want to hear this in silence. Thank you. No plan for Sorry, the Mr. for the Peel Hospital, Mr. Speaker. So, Miss. Well, a leader of the opposition, um, you don't get a free go or call your order for the first time. So, Mr. Speaker, there is an election in the wind, and the people of Western Australia have a choice. We have a choice about whether we keep Western Australia safe and strong whether we put patients first. And for the people of Dawesville, Mandra and Murray Wellington, the question is clear. There is only one government that will invest in the future of Peel Health, and there's only one government that will bring these services back in house, and that is a Labor McGowan government. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Science. Can you explain why there are gaping holes in your proposed electric vehicle network, including 1,600 kilometres of the Great Northern Highway? Members. In addition to the fact the EV network does not even link up with South Australia. <laughs> Heavens above. Well, I want to congratulate the. Uh, I want to congratulate the new deputy leader of the opposition for uh, for asking for the Dorothy Sexer for uh, in respect of EVs that I was going to get asked a bit later on. Oh, so, <laughs> so, thank you very much, uh, member for Vass, for asking me a question about our new electric vehicle strategy. We're very proud of the strategy that we announced uh, earlier this week. Electric vehicles have been around for a while, and I do remember that under the eight years of the former government, you did nothing, you did nothing to promote this technology. Now, you probably don't know that, you probably weren't paying attention, but during the eight and a half years, you did nothing. Now, what we have done is we have consulted with industry on how best uh, to kickstart EVs in WA, because EV take-up in Western Australia is low. It is very low. There's, there's less than 1,500 EVs on the road in Western Australia, uh, less than 1 per cent. So what can government do? What can government best do uh, to kickstart this industry? So what we've done, we've announced uh, a $21 million strategy, which includes the longest uh, uh, charging EV station network uh, in Australia. You'll be able to go from Esperance all the way to Kununurra. So the longest in Australia, arguably uh, one of the longest in the world. Now you're not happy with that? Sure. It doesn't go everywhere in Western Australia, that's for sure. But what it does do is it builds the spine. It builds the backbone of a network. So people can have the confidence that they can leave their major towns and go uh, throughout most parts of the state with their electric vehicles. So sure, there are parts you can't go to, but you will be able to drive from Esperance to Kununurra, you'll be able to go to Kalgoorlie. Uh, the, the response from industry has been overwhelmingly positive. <laughs> Overwhelmingly positive, members because they see 
they see this as a major step forward. And we, we know that once we do this, other players will come into the market and build out the network. They will build out the network. So we have put the first significant money of any state government uh, into uh, elect an electric vehicle policy. The, arguably one of the largest networks in, a, in the world, overwhelming endorsement from industry, and you, you're complaining about it. Absolutely out. <laughs> Astonishing. Supplementary. Supplementary. Yeah. Members. Supplementary. Supplementary. Minister, why at the announcement did you not even know how many charging stations your EV network has? Is it because... Is it... Is it because your government... Members, members. It's a bit of a stretch. You don't know. Yeah. You don't know how much Metronet costs. Members. You stop Minister, interjecting me. Why at the announcement... Minister for Transport. I call it order for yes. the first time. Minister, why at the announcement did you not even know how many charging stations your EV network has? Is it Members. because your government has failed to do the proper work over four years? Or did you just forget? Members, uh, look, um, Mr. Speaker, Members. we've announced it's the biggest investment in EV charging networks in Australia. Of any state, uh, it's, uh, it's the biggest financial investment. Oh, it's big. Good for that. Oh, the network may be big. Yes, it's yours is it's big. It's one of the biggest networks in the world. You will be able to drive from the opposition to Kununurra. You'll be able to go to Kalgoorlie, and once the spine of that network is in place, as EVs pick up, other places will be filled up. Now, what we've said is we are going to further consult with industry about how we build that network, and that will impact upon exactly where the charging stations are placed, uh, how many, whether they are you know, 25 Members kilowatts, whether they are 50, whether they are 350, the size of those charging stations. All that will be worked out because we are going to talk to industry about that. It will be based on the... Have you read the report that UWA did? Yeah, well, you will know... You will know that a substantial amount of work has... Member oh. for Vass, I call you for the first and second Look, time. I'm, I must admit... Uh, it's, it's an extraordinary... You know, th this was the question that I was going to get asked later on, because no, we are so pleased with this announcement. Industry is so pleased. Uh, and yet, once again, you are nitpicking. Nitpicking, nitpicking. We're working with industry. They're happy. Uh, you know, it's extraordinary. One of the longest EV charging networks in the world, the biggest in Australia, and you're not happy. Yeah. Member for Mount Lawley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Police. Minister, I refer to the work undertaken by the McGowan Labor government to keep Western Australia safe and strong through its unprecedented support for our hard-working police officers. And I ask, can the Minister outline to the House what the McGowan Labor government's historic police compensation scheme will mean for medically retired police officers across Western Australia? Minister for Police. I thank the member for Mount Lawley uh, for that question and for his uh, very strong support of our police officers, indeed his strong support of all workers and, and their protections uh, in the workplace. Uh, I'm delighted, Mr Speaker, with the commitment that the McGowan Labor government has made to police in this state. We've increased the size of the police budget. We've relegated to history those cuts that were put in place by the former Liberal government. And we've increased the size of our uh, police budget by about $750 million. Uh, this is huge. It is significant. Uh, we're committed to keeping our community safe. And as part of doing that, we have to support our police to do that job to keep our community safe. Uh, we've committed to an unprecedented 1,100 additional officers. 150 of those were delivered first off. 150 that we committed to only in April have already been engaged. And the further 800 uh, committed to during the recent police budget uh, are, uh, are already uh, programmed. The first 200 of those will be engaged in this financial year, that is before June 30th this year and 200 a year thereafter. 
I am also pleased that we have provided the protections that they need to do the job, the personal issues stab proof vests. Uh, but nothing pleases me more than perhaps my uh, the original commitment uh, where we covered police officers with OCH Health and Safety after years of them not having that, uh, than now to be able to offer the, uh, the compensation when they leave the job. It was a three-part plan. We delivered $16 million a couple of years ago uh, for the police redress scheme for, uh, and offered payments of up to $150,000 to those people who had been poorly treated in the past, and we offered uh, them that redress. In addition to that, Mr Speaker, uh, last year I moved through the parliament uh, the uh, amendments to Section 8 of the Police Act, so we no longer retire those police officers under the same undignified uh, process that we do those officers that have a uh, a cloud of corruption hanging over them. And now the final piece. Uh, universally welcome and applauded at the recent police conference uh, that we will provide uh, that police compensation. We will do it through the Police Act uh, and we will provide, uh, we'll provide this end of service payment in addition to keeping all current in-service and post-service entitlements. That was the key point that was never offered uh, under any former government. Uh, every former government wanted to take something away in terms of uh, existing police conditions. We're not doing that. Uh, we will uh, provide for termination uh, payments capped generally at around $236,000, but potentially up to $413,000. There will be a payment for vocational support and retraining of up to six, of, uh, potentially over $16,000. Uh, we will maintain those current in-service and post-service entitlements uh, for uh, work and non-work-related illness or injury. And those leave payments for medical expenses provided to an officer would not be uh, included in the calculation for an exit payment. Officers also preserve their option to seek an ex gratia payment or an act, act of grace payment. Uh, this is an amazing step forward. It's something that uh, police officers in this state have deserved. We ask those officers to run toward danger, to protect us, to protect the community, to turn out to road crashes, to go to horrific scenes where people have been murdered uh, and where other violent acts have occurred. Uh, we, in turn, need to support them. And I have never been prouder of the McGowan government than when our Premier stood there at the recent police union co conference and made that commitment that if a McGowan government is re-elected early next year, that will be a priority for us. Yeah. Uh, the member for Georgia. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Transport. Minister, I refer to the proposed Dongra to Geraldton bypass route, which will directly impact houses, including some that are heritage listed, properties and livelihoods in the walkway area, as well as the environmentally sensitive wetlands in the Alanooka area, area. And I ask, Minister, will you table the business case for this route and detail any alternative routes main roads is considering? Minister. I thank the member for Geraldton for that question. Now, as I've outlined before, um, this issue has been an issue, a hard um, sort of issue to tackle over many, many years. Now, the route definition work actually started under the previous government, and the inland uh, route was actually uh, the preferred model that was taken to the then, uh, as I understand, minister back in 2015, 2016, and nothing ever eventuated in respect to dealing with the public. So what we did is when we won government, a key issue was put to me was that we need certainty. And I remember meeting with representatives from the corridor saying, from the relevant council saying, we want certainty. We want to have the route alignment finalised. So can you get on with doing it? And that's what we uh, sought to do. So as you know, there was a corridor released. Not that route alignment, but a corridor release, and that is up to out for public consultation. All those issues you've raised in relation to impact on stru homes, structures and other issues will be picked up as part of that. And I urge the National Party to work with the residents to put their views across. Because you can work with them, you can put submissions, you can use your talents and your expertise in working with those residents to make sure that their submissions are high, high, 
highlight their concerns. And so that is why we're going out to public consultation. We also understood that this was an issue that affects many people, so we've extended the public consultation to uh, March the 31st. There is no route alignment, it's a preferred corridor, as in there's no specific route alignment, there's a preferred corridor. And as I said in a meeting up in um, Geraldton, as I've said in numerous um, uh, radio and television interviews, we are now going through the process of talking to everyone to see how we can make sure that that alignment does not impact or minimises the impact on private land ownership. The other point, member, and the point you need to be aware of, is your, is your preferred um, solution the Brand Highway? Because that actually affects more landowners. Yeah. And that affects more landowners. So it's always easy to say, don't do that one, because that impacts um, so many. But your proposed, if that is your proposed route, actually affects more. So we're going to have a careful, considered approach. I urge the National Party, if you want to engage in this, if you want to engage in this, work with the landowners, put forward proposals, put forward alternatives. Just don't say no, put forward alternatives, and we're very keen to sit down and talk to you about that. And as a local representative, that's what you should be doing. Because I know when I was in opposition, and there were issues in my community, I worked with the community to put forward their suggestions. I, just did, I wasn't a lazy opposition member who just fueled fear, um, fear in the public. I actually worked with people to make sure that we could actually put forward um, po um, good solutions. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister, given the significant impact that this proposed bypass will have on the walkaway community, Minister, will you commit to meeting with the impacted families ahead of the 2021 state election? Minister. There will be no decision on the alignment before the consultation finishes. So the consultation finishes on March the 31st. Before any, any um, decision is made, I commit to work uh, to meeting with the community. But that is after the first round of consultation and before any decision is made. So, you know, you want to make this into an election platform. You want to make sure, instead of actually helping people and working with people, wanting to make them scared, if that's what you want to do, you do that. But there's an opportunity, as, an op as the member for Geraldton, to actually work with the community and put forward some options and some alternatives and actually work. Now, if you want to go and tell the 100 landowners, if you want to go and tell the 100 landowners along Brown Highway what you're going to do to their land in your suggestion, you do that. But don't come in here and just say do this or do that. There is no decision. There is a discussion and community consultation. There is a corridor. But if we can improve and make sure the route alignment minimises any impact, takes into, the consider, takes into account all the concerns, we'll do that. Of course we'll do that. But stop being lazy. And I've seen the comments that... Work with the community, put forward some viable suggestions and we'll listen to you. Uh, the speaker, in my haste to get to my speech. Speaker, my question is to the Attorney General, and I refer to the Corruption and Crime Commission's recent report on the misuse of electorate allowances by Liberal members of Parliament. And I ask, can the Attorney General outline to the House what the report revealed about the activities of some of the members of the Procedure and Privileges Committee in the Legislative Council? Attorney General. I thank the member for Kalamunda for the question, and it's a very important question he asked. When the report on electoral allowances and the management of electoral officers was uh, published by the CCC last week, a lot of the publicity surrounded the titillating revelations that members of the Liberal Party were using public funds for sex holidays in uh, Japan and wine tours in South Australia. And whilst that is uh, shameful and scandalous enough, Beneath that, and when you dig down into the report, there is corruption at the highest echelons of the Liberal Party, and it's absolutely shameful. Uh, it was uh, on the 1st of April 2019, the 1st of April 2019, Mr Edmund, whilst he was under orders from the CCC not to tell anyone about the inquiry, warned a number of people, including a member of the Liberal Party, Mr Brian Ellis, Mr Hallett and the Honourable Ricky Mazza, of the CCC's inquiries and what they were inquiring into. Uh, <clears throat> On the 16th of August this year, Mr Edmund received a text 
from a member of the Privileges Committee, not being the Honourable Ricky Mazza, offering support. And when this uh, report was being handed down, the Premier was briefed, as the Leader of the Opposition was briefed upon its contents, and the CCC were asked by the Premier, was any member of the Labor Party involved, because we don't want any member of the Labor caucus involved in corrupting the inquiries into this. An assurance was given, an assurance were given that the unnamed members in this report were either Liberals or shooters and fishers. So that when we go to uh, the, uh, <coughs> the report, paragraph 437, Mr Edmund received a text message from a, from a Procedure and Privileges Committee, a male person, so that excludes the President, this must be the Honourable Simon O'Brien. And indeed, the Honourable Simon O'Brien, uh, on the 5th of September, in the Legislative Council, said, I might add that I feel some empathy for anyone caught in the situation that Mr Edmund and his family seem to be caught in at the moment. So he was expressing support publicly in the Parliament for Mr Edmund, whom we know is corrupt on the findings of the, of the report. It was only just two days before uh, that the Honourable uh, Simon O'Brien telephoned support for Mr Edmund, two days before that, that's on the 14th of August, that the Privileges and Pri Privileges Member, Committee Attorney tabled General. the report... Attorney General. Attorney General is making unsubstantiated allegations against a member of the other place. And unless there is substantiation, he doesn't have the ability to refute that. I seek your advice as to whether he's able to do that. Members. making accusations about the other house as long as you have fact to back it up. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank you for your advice, and I will be careful. Just two days before, just two days before the uh, text message went from the member of the Privileges Committee, uh, uh, not being the Honourable Ricky Mazza and not being a female, therefore being a, uh, a member of the Liberal Party, uh, just two days before that, <coughs> uh, the Privileges and... Pr uh, Procedure and Privileges Committee tabled the report, number 55, banning uh, Darren Foster from handing over the former Liberals' emails uh, to the CCC. And we can all recall what, uh, uh, what Mr Edmund said should happen uh, to that computer and those emails, because in the previous report, Mr Edmund said that the best thing that could happen to that computer is that it should be thrown in the river. At the moment, it's locked. At the moment, it is locked in the safe of the um, uh, of the Parliament in the upper house. Now, this this is this this this, this whole procedure. This whole procedure of the committee has been corrupted by someone within that committee. By someone within that committee, ringing up, ringing up a target of the CCC ringing up a Liberal colleague who was a target, a former Liberal colleague who was a target of the CCC to offer support for them whilst they were sitting on that Privileges Committee. So it's not good enough for the, for the new leader of the opposition to go out and say, we will not tolerate corruption at any level in the, in the Liberal Party. We will not tolerate corruption at any level. It's up, to the, it's, up, it's up to the new leader of the opposition now to go out and ask Mr O'Brien whether this was him who sent this text message, this voicemail message to Mr Edmund. And if it is, he should be asking Mr O'Brien to resign from the Privileges Committee and the Liberal Party should throw him out of the Liberal Party room before Christmas. Before Christmas. Otherwise, there's no room for the new leader of the Liberal Party to say we are against corruption at all level. You will go into this election with a stinking mess hanging around your neck like a dead albatross if you don't deal with this corruption at this stage. This state cannot afford to return to a party that tolerates this sort of corruption and this sort of cover-up uh, leader of the opposition. Yes. 
Uh, Member for Hillary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Premier, Member I refer. For water. I refer to the out-of-control crime in Broome, which has reached the point that the local community is forced to organise a community rally. And I ask, why are you and your ministers ignoring the people of Broome by refusing to attend this crime rally that is being held next week? Uh, Mr. Premier. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker uh, I became aware of uh, this issue uh, very recently. Uh, the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs uh, will be uh, attending the rally, as indeed will be, uh, or the, the meeting, uh, as indeed will be the uh, local MP, uh, as indeed will be uh, at least one Assistant uh, Commissioner of uh, Police, uh, uh, Assistant Commissioner uh, Darrell uh, Gaunt, Mr Speaker. Uh, but it is, uh, it is the case, Mr Speaker, that uh, we're investing a great deal of effort and a great deal of money in a range of initiatives across the Kimberley uh, in order to deal with um, uh, and assist youth. Um, you've got to actually provide uh, opportunities for young people to do things that are constructive. Uh, you've got to provide opportunities for, people to get, for young people to go on the right pathway. Uh, and so there's $6.2 million of initiatives in the Kimberley Juvenile Justice Strategy, including night patrols, uh, youth engagement program, integrated learning program uh, across the Kimberley. There's $150,000 granted to Agunya uh, uh, Limited to implement the Broome Purpose for Life program. Uh, and uh, as you know, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've invested hugely uh, in schooling, uh, in TAFE, uh, in uh, additional um, opportunities for uh, residential uh, living uh, for students from across the Kimberley uh, to provide them with those pathways and those new ways uh, forward in terms of um, uh, in, you know, self improvement and uh, providing opportunity for young people. Uh, so, um, Mr Speaker, on top of that, of course, uh, the state government has announced uh, and has funded uh, over this term uh, and the next 1,100 additional police officers. 1,100 additional police officers, Mr Speaker. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, a great many of those will go to regional Western Australia. Uh, and uh, they'll be involved, as regional police officers are, uh, not just in law enforcement but with working with young people. Uh, I was in Newman recently and uh, police officers were there uh, playing football uh, with uh, young uh, uh, youth, uh, in order to uh, in, in order to engage them, Mr. Speaker, uh, and uh, ensure that uh, uh, police work with uh, young people. Uh, so all those initiatives are out there, Mr. Speaker. We're doing all of those things, uh, and uh, they're all very constructive. Uh, and if you go to Broome and the Kimberley, you'll find no government ever has put as much effort into these sorts of social initiatives, uh, these sorts of um, infrastructure to create jobs, Aboriginal employment programs, uh, Aboriginal business, business programs, uh, public sector employment of Aboriginal people, all of the things uh, that will pr improve the lives and the outcomes and the opportunities uh, of people all over the Kimberley, in particular Aboriginal people. Supplementary. Premier, given that you and your minister seem to be able to fly to Broome all the time for good news announcements, why did, it take, why did it take such significant negative media attention before any minister finally relented and accepted to go to this uh, meeting organised next week? Mr Speaker, once again, with this MP, a ridiculous and pathetic uh, supplementary, Mr Speaker. But I will tell you somewhere I've been recently. I went to Hillary's, Mr Speaker, and I announced a new primary school. I announced a new primary school there in Hillary's, Mr Speaker, Member with our Hillary's, outstanding ca candidate, right. Caitlin Collins, Mr Speaker, an educator uh, committed to young people uh, throughout Western Australia, and I'm sure uh, that she will do a great job in that electorate if she is elected, Mr Speaker. And I'll tell you what, Mr Speaker, she'll be a much nicer person than you are. That's the end of question time, members. Personal explanation, Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to rise to make a personal explanation under standing order.